Hey guys, after Panakov's win yesterday, I feel like firing the 5k6 max. I was told it's a very easy field, so we're going fishing. We're gonna have some fun. Uh, we're a bit late, but apparently someone reserved our seat. Let's go find out. Hello guys. Oh my goodness. Oh my going fishing today. My plan in a 5k6 max was to keep everyone guessing. No one was gonna know what I'm up to. They thought I'm either a psycho, maybe a really good player, or just a fun player. They had no idea. So initially we started a tournament really deep, 200 bigs deep, and I knew that I can just um, try to outplay a lot of people post swaps since they're not really used to playing wide ranges this deep. Uh, the first hand we have is 5-4 suited in the cutoff, and I raised to 500. The small blind goes to a 2500 raise and I call. The flop comes king, nine, five, two spades, and he decides to check. I decide to bet pretty big, 66%, which is something I would do with a lot of my strong king X and all my sets. The turn is the king of diamonds and he checks again. This is pretty good because it means he has less king X in his range and he's gonna have actually a lot of pairs that I can put a lot of pressure on. I have a flush draw, I have a bottom pair, I do block some king five suited combos, but um, there's not many and I block fives, but he's probably not three betting that. It's more about my range versus his range. If I bet big here again, he has a very hard time with all his pocket pairs that can't really improve on the river that much. He's gonna have a really hard time with a nine. He's gonna have a hard time with uh, better flush draws even that have pretty good equity. You know, if he has like ace nine, uh, ace eight of spades or something like that, he's gonna have to fold. So I size up and go for 75% bet, and he ends up folding. Our opponent is Joseph Chong. He's basically a leopard chong. You love to see him in the ocean, but he's still a predator. He's creative and aggressive, but he does a lot of wacky stuff. And as long as you haven't figured it out, I think he's pretty fun to play with, and we can handle him. I have ace four off on the button, and I raised to 1800. Joseph Chong, or known as Subime, a high stakes crusher online, calls from the big blind. The flop is Jack 10 6 Rainbow. I decide to go for one third C bet, and he calls. The turn is a deuce. I'm basically giving up. Uh, I can't get him to fold much, especially with my ace high. I don't have much equity. I check back. The river is an ace, and he checks. I bet 4,800 for value, and he takes a bit of time and check raises to 15,000. I was thinking that this is for sure. Um, a lot of value hands, but the size is too good for me to consider folding, mostly because he's going to be turning too many hands into bluffs. He actually turned Queen Jack into bluff, which goes with my read, because that's actually a pretty easy river call, because if he's not even getting me to fold Ace-4, then his, his bluff on the river is not really ever working. Initially, I misclicked open to 6,800 when I meant to make it 1,800. I don't know how that happened. And then the guy raises to 20,000, and I thought I had 8,7 suited. And I actually had 8,7 off suit, which I didn't realize. I called, then I look at my hand after calling, realize it's 8,7 off suit. I'm like, oh no. And the flop is, yeah, 7,5 deuce. I bet call the check raise, and then I fold all in on the turner. And the guy shows aces, so. I don't know what voodoo magic this guy just did, but somehow just got me to give him around like 50k <laughs> for no reason. Uh, just because I both yeah, I mean, misread my hand and just punted it off. So, still in, still have 160k. Need to bounce back and not let this moment like dictate the future of the tournament. I'm playing really good and uh, I'm not gonna let one brain fart change anything. You're here. You see this morning we woke up uh, quite hungover because we we're partying last night for Alex's win and I literally just basically fell on my face. Um, <laughs> not exactly sure what happened but I guess hangovers, uh, Vegas hangovers are a bit harder than uh, the ones back home. 
your weekend of the World Series of Poker, uh, your stay here, how do you feel about your game? Um, I, I always thought that when I don't feel 100% that I'm going to be playing bad or something like that. Um, I've been struggling to sleep for a while now, but honestly, I feel really good. Um, I think like all the, the one year of streaming and kind of putting in volume has helped me kind of focus a bit more on my game and just not deviate and make any mistakes. So I feel really, really good, honestly. On day two, I basically punted off my stack. I wasn't feeling well and I did a couple of bluffs that didn't go through and then I ended up just shoving a six suited versus a button open and I got called and lost. We couldn't get much footage that day because we didn't have a media pass. Luckily for us, after, you know, doing a couple of Lebanese movements as they say, we managed to score a media pass so all the footage moving forward is going to be higher quality than they were. Hopefully you enjoy and remember we put a lot of effort into this. Please help me grow the channel. We have Tamar over here, who is on the final table. Oh God, you touched it. Touched it. <laughs> Don't touch my wrist. I didn't know it was there. <laughs> Tamar is on the final table of the 5K 6 Max and has $770,000 up top. I met Tamar eight years ago in Montreal when we were both playing a poker tournament and I was wearing an orange hoodie, he was wearing a light green hoodie. And we both realized like, ah, oh, we like to annoy people. I feel pretty good, to be honest. Uh, I started short stacked yesterday and as you know an hour into uh, the tournament you came over gave me this little guy and that's when the run gets started and uh, yeah fully converted rooster believer at this point yeah so. welcome to a special edition of Beruzi garden reviews after a long day of grinding on day one with about two hours left so this would be at like midnight michael mizraki late redges this tournament and just sits to my direct left um, I don't know if I should say he's like <laughs> inebriated or... Well, uh, it is quite known that he is <laughs> yeah. usually not in the best shape. So, really. <laughs> let's just say that uh, he had come to play. I opened the cutoff with aces, two aces with the ace of diamonds, and Michael Mizraki quickly three bets me on the button. Um, now I'm thinking to myself that he's, you know, he's quite a loose player, so... I want to charge him for his good hands to see a flop. So I 4-bet him to a pretty big size. I go to over 3x with my 4-bet. And he just snap calls me. And the flop comes jack 10-8 all diamonds. I have aces with the ace of diamond. This is a pretty great flop for me because obviously not only do I have an over player and an out flush draw, but there are not many diamonds that hit the board besides king queen of diamond. Or at least I thought. <laughs> So I see that about 30% um, of the pot and Michael Mizraki just immediately, he, while shuffling all his big chips, just immediately th tosses all of them, just shuffling, throws them all into the pot. After about five seconds of thought, I'm like, okay, you can't have a flush. And I just go all in and he announces flush. And I say to him, no, you can't have a flush here. You have queen, queen of diamonds, really? And instead he turns over queen, six of diamonds for a pretty loose four bet peel. <laughs> and so in, in, at the very last level of the day, I end up losing an absolutely huge pot. It would have been for chip lead of the tournament. And it was about half of my stack at this point. Not too pleased after, you know, grinding like 12 hours for him to just show up and play queen six of diamonds that way and win half of my stack. On day two, I was sitting there with a pretty short stack, just thinking to myself, you know, maybe the gods will have some kind of gift for me. And all of a sudden I get tapped on my shoulder and I look behind and no one else besides Beruzi right here. We gave him the booster booster. He's a bit superstitious right now. Rooster's trying to focus, trying to get a big chip rate to go on the final table so that he can go and cheer him on. <laughs> and no joke, he hands me the rooster and literally, literally the first hand, I get aces and just win a nice pot. And I'm like, he was blessed! <laughs> That's when I knew things were about to take a turn. And yeah, after that, I just um, run pretty hot for a few levels, make some nice plays, and build up a nice stack. <laughs> so one of those hands, the aces, was the one that really got you straight into the chip lead. Uh, Matt Bond was the chip leader of the tournament, and he had been very active and also using uh, pretty big open sizings. And this time he opens on the hijack, and I look down at aces on the button, which is a beautiful spot. So I go for another big size 3-bet because I just think that he's likely to continue playing after I've already done it twice. And he calls me pretty quickly 
And the flop comes down 6-5 deuce rainbow. Uh, it's a pretty great board for me. He checks, I bet about a third of the pot and he calls. The turn comes down a uh, seven of diamonds bringing a diamond draw. I have two aces with the ace of diamonds. He checks and I bet again, this time I bet about half pot and he thinks for a minute or two before going all in. And it was a pretty big jam at this point. Obviously it was for about chip lead of the tournament. And yeah, I thought to myself for quite a few minutes, I think if I had um, like not the ace of diamonds or kings even, it would have been a, an easier call, but blocking some of his not flush draws, uh, it was a little harder, but at the same time, I knew he would be peeling a lot of loose hands and turning a lot of hands into bluffs. So I eventually make the call and he turns over ace four of spades, which is absolutely the best hand I could possibly see yeah. because he just has an open ender and that's it. And we hold and take the chip lead of the tournament. I recall I was uh, railing you for a while that day, uh, 10 hours in total, watching you just like yeah. uh, amass a large chip stack. And um, it seemed like you mostly had a lot of like average spots, nothing crazy. But the next hand was probably one of the biggest ones of the tournament. It's at the unofficial final table with seven people left. When the unofficial final table, Stefan Song had about 25 million chips. And I was in second with 10 million chips. and. I actually had a big lead over third as well. So there was huge ICM pressure on me at the point. There were two people with 15 bigs and two people with 25 bigs. Stefan Song opening a lot of hands opens the cutoff. And I look down at two nines in the small blind. Uh, pretty standard flat at this point, nothing else we can do. So I call and the big blind folds. The flop comes down, queen 10, nine, rainbow. So um, a pretty, pretty good flop obviously for nines. I check and Stefan Song puts in uh, a smallish bet. Um, obviously, we don't really want to get all the chips in, even though we have such a good hand, but the ICM pressure is just so huge that we want to mostly just be calling. So I call and the turn is the five of spades, bringing a flush draw. Still a wonderful turn for me. I check and Stefan Song puts out a pretty hefty bet. At this point, it's a really complicated spot because uh, he has a lot of hands with equity and my hand is just really strong, so it's very tempting for me to jam. But again, he still has all of his jack eights, all of his king jacks, and you know, getting it in against something like a combo draw with spades is not a great spot. So after thinking for a couple of minutes, I decide to just call due to the ICM pressure and the river comes down a king, which is the last thing I wanted to see. Yeah. <laughs> At this point, I check and he goes for about a half pot bet, which is, you know, scream to me trying to get more value than anything. And I mean, it's a pretty easy fold for me at this point, just an unfortunate river. Yeah, I recall you folded and then now you were tied for second and third place. Yeah. And that caused, uh, it shifted a lot of the imbalance already at the final table uh, towards St uh, Steven Song, who had all the chips now, and everyone else is just basically trying to survive because you were all short. Now you're second in chips, five people left. Uh, you had a really difficult final table bubble, it was very swingy up and down. Yes, sir. And then you finished off with uh, busting the, per the last person and regained your second place in chips. Yeah. Um, are you excited? How's your family feel? Oh. How do your supporters back oh. home feel? Oh, it's it's honestly been great. Like one of the best things is like so many of my childhood friends just reaching out, you know, like telling me how excited they are, how they're just like checking the updates all the time. It's been like, like just amazing just to, you know, talk to all these people, all of them I haven't talked to for so long. Now, introducing Tamer C and Enemies. Uh, we will start with the French player, Jonathan Pastore. Jonathan is a salmon shark, or as they say in French, requin de baguette. He is new to this final table. He hasn't had a World Series final table before, but he's been playing very well. And I overheard that he has a pet of not cutting his hair until he wins a bracelet. So this means a lot. The next sea creature is Pareskevas Sokaridis. This is a Greek pro who has been very short the whole time in the tournament, literally for like the last five hours of the day, somehow still survived and made the final table when he had no chips. He's basically like a Hydra. You cut off a limb, it regrows. Next up is Steven Song. This is one of the most fun players I've ever watched playing. He's very talkative, very chatty, but he's actually a great white shark. 
He's like Bruce from Finding Nemo. He acts like he's everyone's friend, but he's actually just ruining everyone's life. Finally, there's Elio Fox. Elio is one of the best players in the world. He plays a lot online. I've played against him a lot. He's really difficult to play against, extremely smart, and has been crushing the online high stakes and live poker. He's an Antarctic killer whale, usually swims alone, but can battle anyone. One of the opponents on the, the table brought a melon, and that's because his name is Cantaloupe online. What you don't know about Tamar is his nickname is You Are Melon. So I felt the need to really battle hard on this one. So I go, went on Twitter and asked if someone can bring me a watermelon for $100. And we got our own watermelon <laughs> delivery man coming <laughs> soon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, coming into the final table five handed, I was in second place with a pretty decent lead over third place. Again, a spot with a lot of ICM pressure, and um, I looked down at two queens from um, first position, which was the hijack. I open, and uh, Stefan Song, the chip leader, in the big blind, puts in a three bet. At this point, I go all in with my two queens, uh, given stack sizes, ICM pressure, there's no point in inducing in the spot. So I just go all in and he quickly calls me while turning over his cards and placing his chips in. And I thought I, I had ran into kings or aces for sure, just the way that he had called so confidently. Uh, but somehow he turns over two queens, which at that point I was very happy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> On the on the rail as well, like we were six of us, and it happened so quick as well. Like just cards were flipped. No one had any idea what's going on, but we knew that he was the one with the action on him, and we all thought you're for sure behind. Yeah. Just the, the yeah, instant I, I call thought as well. It was such a such a confident call. I was like, oh no, yeah, really. Happened. That would have been very annoying to finish fifth when you were second in chips. For sure. Luckily, I mean, it was a chopped pot in the end, and after that. Do you recall anything special? No, I was pretty, uh, I didn't have many spots after that. The guy who was third in chips ends up eliminating the guy in fourth and fifth. So he ends up moving into second place and I just didn't have many spots at this point. At the end, I get it in with um, ace five against queen seven, BVB. And the flop looked good, but the turn brought a seven and that's all she wrote. In the end, you finished third for 330,000. I believe this is one of your largest scores of all time. It is your first final table in Vegas. How does it feel to just like come back officially to Vegas for the first time really as a, you know, a dedicated trip and just instantly start with a massive score like this? Oh, it was just unbelievable. It was such a great feeling. Like just not, obviously not just the money, but you know, it was just, <laughs> genuinely so fun to go deep and you know have everyone's support and everything it was just such a blast oh boy. Oh guys, thanks for the support i appreciate it it's his problem now <laughs> is this just mine where did you even get this <laughs>